we all know that digital is responsible for the greatest growth of productivity and permeates all sectors of the economy. But it has also shown its potential to face the health crisis is astonishing. The COVID-19 pandemic has, in addition, made it crystal clear how important is very high capacity networks and investments on that. It has been paramount in mitigating the negative effects of the quarantine, making possible teleworking, e-commerce, e-learning or leisure. It has also given examples of the potential that the new developments such as AI data analytics and 3D printing have to offer when facing this unexpected crisis. Indeed, we have seen how digital technologies have been instrumental in order to identify and monitor the evolution of the spread and evaluate the strategies for controlling the pandemic. By the same token, digital has optimized traffic flows and improvement efficiency and has improved the efficiency of logistics and the supply chain, be it of medical equipment or of essential supplies. This morning, we have a slightly larger panel than usual. It is composed of actors that have played and are playing an important role during this crisis. And they will show us specific actions that they have taken as well as very valuable conclusions that they have drawn from their experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pilar. Uh, in the absence of Anthony Whelan, I would like to ask Stephen Tass to start, please. Over to you, Stephen. Well, am I unmuted? You're now unmuted. We can hear you. Well, first of all, a big thank you uh, from Etno to you, Pilar, and to the EIF team for organizing uh, this debate today. Uh, also, a word of thank you to the European Commission and to Parliament. Um, we are looking today into the pit of one of the toughest uh, recessions in history, and I think we must all be grateful for uh, the work that President von der Leyen and the Parliament did uh, in the past weeks uh, to, to keep things together. Um, I firmly believe that the solution to the recession is a European one. Uh, there is no other credible uh, uh, solution. Uh, moving to the core of the discussion uh, today, uh, there's also another necessary element uh, in order to have a credible solution, and Phil had already referred to that. It's digitalization. We see it clearly in this crisis. Uh, people and companies that are coping the best uh, with this crisis are those who have better uptake of digital technologies. Um, but there are still important gaps. Uh, we should, in my opinion, particularly focus on SMEs, uh, on the inclusion of all uh, citizens. Not all SMEs in Europe have already good e-commerce infrastructure. Uh, many of our companies are stepping up their efforts to help SMEs in this period, but we all need to do even more. That's the reason why we as Ethno support a strong focus on digitalization in the coming months as we work on the recovery. Today, uh, more than ever, I'm proud to be working in this uh, uh, sector. Uh, I saw my colleagues here in, in, in Belgium and Proximus, uh, but everywhere in Europe working 24 hours every day to uh, cope with the crisis. Uh, our engineers have been handling uh, peaks in, in traffic of more than 50%. Uh, our networks have shown to be resilient, and that's thanks to the hard work of our people. Um, and it also already referred to it also. We have been working with governments, with regulators, and, and with the European Commission uh, to use network data to help uh, health authorities. It's important to stress that we have done all this with uh, strict respect of, of privacy, of course. It's an essential uh, requirement for us. And most of the European telecom operators have given uh, out uh, unlimited data and voice plans, and, and they did this almost instinctively already in the first days of the crisis. 
But I can't hide it. There are, of course, also challenges. Uh, we have more uh, customers that don't have the money to pay the bill at the end of the month. Um, our sector has also some pre-existing challenges uh, because of the high level of investments uh, in 5G, in fiber. Uh, we see the stock markets uh, reacting nervously. And we also have uh, worrying spikes in, in misinformation around 5G. Uh, Ethno and GSMA uh, data shows that there was over more than 80, so 80 cases of arson attacks against telecom towers across eight European countries. Um, and this is an area where the political leadership across Europe uh, should really help us and continue to speak up, uh, speak out firmly. Uh, it's really a paradoxical uh, situation. Eh? Our networks are essential uh, to keep society and economy together. And it's exactly at this time that our four G towers are being uh, attacked. Even worse, some of our people have been attacked. Uh, this is unreasonable. Uh, 5G is a safe technology with significant benefits for society. So we really must act against this with the same energy as against the vaccination and disinformation, in my opinion. That being said, I, I remain positive. I feel a strong sense of responsibility from all actors. Uh, we need to stay focused on the things that matter. Stepping up the support for the rollout of 5G networks, stepping up the support for investments in telecommunication networks, stepping up the support for European innovation. I think our studies in the past have already shown that uh, digitalization can add a lot to GDP in, in Europe, uh, up to uh, 2 trillion by 2030. So already before this was a political priority, now it's simply a matter of, it's an existential uh, matter. There are opportunities in this crisis. Uh, I think we can learn how to do even more remote work. I personally believe we should be careful not to scale back on our green ambitions in Europe. We can do more e-commerce. We can accelerate the adoption of new digital technologies. There is room to work on an acceleration of digital sovereignty in, in Europe. And I'm positive that the EU has all the leadership it needs to go after these ambitious uh, objectives and to help Europeans uh, to get out of this uh, recession. So you can count on, on, on Ethno and its members and on my personal uh, commitment. Thank you, Maria. Back to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, very clear. Um, and now would, I would like to give the floor to Cecilia uh, with the Digital Europe. Please, Cecilia. Thank you yours. so much. So um, maybe just making an overall point first. Uh, I have been super amazed with uh, with the collaboration across private and public sector in this period. Uh, person in, in Digital Europe, we have established um, a COVID ex um, executive council with CEOs across basically both our health members, our uh, network members, our software members, but also SMEs coming from, for example, Hungary, Italy, um denmark and and uh, really from all over europe and uh and to see the dynamics between the big and the small companies and um we have come out with a survey i'm going to send a link in the chat box uh basically for everybody if they want to see we had uh, a lot of responses uh around 700 re responses from uh, from members we had uh around four, uh, 22 associations basically sending to all their members also. And what we found out first, basically trying to see what will the business impact be. And uh, for what we see now, actually the nearly everyone, so, so 82% uh, of the employees in the tech sector are working online. Of course, there are people who are more technicians that needs to be uh, on site on security uh, facilities where they simply cannot enter from an offline um, uh, an offline uh, platform or an online platform because it's too too uh, too much security. But eighty two percent actually works from home, and it shows that we have uh, across the different subsectors in the tech sector a highly digitalized way of working, which is very positive. Unfortunately, it's all not. Uh, that doesn't comply with all, all the other sectors. And, and I think this is why what Stephen said, that uh, inclusion and uh, this meaning, for example, schools, but also elderly people and uh, other uh, public functions, 
and SMEs should basically be a huge focus in this crisis. Um, I think uh, a crisis is always an opportunity to basically see where you pull, where you put your short term and long term goals. Right now, we know that more than one third of our SMEs will actually uh, be able to uh, be, be forced to lay off people, substantial amount of people. Whereas many of the bigger companies actually are hiring because they are facing huge demands. And that is, of course, due to this cross border um, nature of, of, this, uh, of this pandemic. That the bigger ones who can basically have the infrastructure to, to, to supply and, and the size and scalability, they face uh, an increased uh, amount of, of, uh, of demand, whereas the smaller, uh, you know, they, they are looking at tenders being closed, they, they can't deliver to, to, uh, to, to the bigger companies who are closed down. And, uh, and I think this is what <clears throat> one of the major risks that we need to look at. How can we basically sustain a digital um, ecosystem where uh, we have enough of the small uh, companies who are often <laughs> also the partners of the big companies and that the bigger companies are also totally dependent on? How can we sustain that uh, that that composition of the of the European digital ecosystem? And the the main uh, tools that they are pointing towards in our survey is that ninety three of them says short term measures that of course enhance enhances their liquidity, meaning uh, postponement of tax, uh, opening new tenders, you know, pushing. Uh, new tenders out now in smaller sizes so they can compete so they they, they are they, they are available for them uh, but of course also salary um, support for example like many countries in different shapes and form and um, they are compensating uh, employees um, salaries uh, due to the, the the lack of demand and ability to work um, I would say one of the things that we also uh, see high on the agenda is more Europe, not less Europe, even though the response has been very kind of uh, too fragmented. Uh, we, I think we can all say in the reaction in the member states, many of the companies are totally dependent on global markets or uh, on the European internal market. And they basically are calling for a higher degree of uh, coordination across country and from the EU, which is very positive, I believe. Now we need to find out how do we do that and how do we get the Commission and the Council basically um, even more empowered than they have been on, until now. We have uh, basically divided our, um, our recommendations into three phases. We have respond, recover and reinvent. And uh, just to mention a few of our recommendations, again, I can send you a link if I succeed in a second with, the, with this platform. Um, uh, the response is the short term what to do now. So urgently boost liquidity and provide financial support for SMEs. Ensure the free flow of uh, ICT goods and maintenance workers across border. Um, recover is basically harness the power of health data to find out how to do tracking apps. Uh, right now, there is a lot of uh, discussion on, on privacy and security. So one of the things is actually to get that guidance and support on data protection and cybersecurity in place ASAP to actually be able to use these apps so we can break the chains of Corona. And remember, I mean, it is un illegal to violate people's privacy. So let's actually believe that we have a law that's working and let's really bring it on ground now. So reinvent, <clears throat> put digital transformation into the EU budget. In the previous EU budget, we only had 2%, in spite of having a totally digital and green strategy, uh, there was almost no money for the two uh, major points of the strategy because they were caught in the old structure. So how do we actually now make sure that we get that, that transformation boosted and get the EU budget aligned with the strategy? And I think this is being reopened now, so it's very positive. Uh, it's a great opportunity to actually get wording and uh, walking the talk aligned uh, for EU. And then basically the, 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 the most um, long term supported measure by our members and their members is basically to launch a stimulus package looking at digital and green. So looking more at long term competitiveness 
and on social benefits of digital, for example, on health solutions, on having networks so we can actually uh, make sure that school teachers can can teach all over Europe uh, using uh, using you know uh, the right bandwidth, having the right connectivity, but also having the right tools to teach children. Um, and to launch that long term, basically to kick off the, the 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 economy and to digitalize in the right places. So, green and digitalization of the right places for for social good in Europe. So for us, uh, we will continue to basically to work with these. Uh, I will share with you in uh, in the chat box uh, the survey and the recommendations. And uh, feel free after after the session to to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cecilia. Very clear messages, and thanks for sharing uh, the link if you if you can. Uh, now over to Elizabeth Krossik with the uh, Relics Group. Please, Elizabeth. Thank you. Well, as a company embedded in this tech world, I have to say I'm really pleased to be here today to make a small contribution to this very important discussion. Um, Relex, to remind everyone, is headquartered in Europe and one of the world's leading developers and users of machine learning technology. And so we use it to help our customers make decisions accurately and faster. And whilst we're better known through some of our brands, such as MLEX and LexisNexis, uh, we're also behind the scenes in many of our daily interactions. So, it's, for example, our fraud detection software is utilized when we set up and use accounts to many of our favorite sites, um, Netflix, I would just call out as we're all uh, enjoying, I think, the, the films and the offerings of Netflix. So we're behind that. Um, it's our data that helps inform Rolls-Royce as to how the engines are performing. Um, but I'm here today because I've been asked to share some practical examples of what we're doing. Uh, I would start from the outset by saying all Relex businesses are working on COVID-19 problems. But I'm going to talk about just two from the Elsevier part of the business. And the first example is from the healthcare division and it's based on the online training we typically offer practitioners. So we've been working with clinicians and hospital staff, many of them, as you know, being redeployed. The other slide. <laughs> the other slide, please. OK, never mind, you can enjoy that slide. Um, we've been working with clinicians and hospital staff many of them being redeployed to COVID duties or brought back from retirement. And what they've been asking for is a one-stop shop for all resources they might need so that they can, for example, use a refresher toolkit or check how to do a procedure. So what we've done is brought together the domain expertise, technology, and our data scientists supporting content from across our many platforms through APIs to make it all available on this free resource center. It's very practical. Um, so it can be used to help refresh people's knowledge with questions such as how do I treat a patient on a ventilator? How do I properly treat, test someone in triage? What special considerations should I give a pregnant woman or a newborn baby? Or what should I tell a patient about his or her condition? You can also find podcasts from experts and new tools and features are being added constantly. So if you are interested in seeing a bit more about that, um, you can see here the details on the slide. Health. There are actually quite a lot of resources for those of us who don't have medical training as well. I found it quite reassuring to look at some of the, the information here to stop me panicking about some of the stuff that I've been reading in the papers. Moving now from healthcare to scientific side, Elsevier disseminates nearly a fifth of the world's scientific articles, so that's particularly relevant for COVID-19. Our data scientists have been working like the telcos round the clock to find ways to speed up the process of surfacing corona related articles so that researchers and the public can have fast free access to them. And one way they've helped is by using AI to replace the traditional keyword search query, the one that uses just related terms and synonyms. And they've replaced that with a machine learning model, which improves both precision and recall. So the AI generated algorithm identifies articles so that they are available online much more quickly. And that's particularly relevant for this quickly developing research area, where with the traditional search, relevant articles could be missed. To date, we've had over 54 million downloads of free articles. And of course, the algorithm keeps learning, so it gets ever more sophisticated. For new articles that are coming in, we will shortly be able to start applying this algorithm even earlier in the publishing process to identify COVID-19 articles that have been submitted. 
that allows us to fast track them for potential peer review and publication. I would end by saying it's never been more necessary or important in a world of fake and pseudoscience to have quality authoritative research to depend upon. These are just two examples where a combination of deep customer understanding, domain expertise, and the latest AI technology are being put to use to help professionals fight the global pandemic. Thank you. Over to you, Maria Rosa. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, great to hear uh, about these, these practical examples you've shared. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Joachim Reiter with uh, Vodafone. Please, Joachim. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so, of course, Vodafone, as uh, Stefan and others have referred to, um, I think many companies, including in the telecom sector, has responded very quickly to this. And of course, Vodafone decided very early on to do everything in its power and everything that is possible to try to support both societies and governments in working through this. And as uh, as uh, was mentioned, of course, we recognize, and, and I think many people recognize the fact that the type of services and the connectivity that we provide has become an essential lifeline for people as they fight through this uh, crisis and will retain that function for society for a very long time, if not forever from now on. Uh, we therefore responded in March and we were lucky and unlucky to be dispersed over the globe. So we already had learning from when the virus hit Hong Kong and Singapore and as it spread into Italy and adjusted our entire company. So in the early March, we came out with a five point plan. Um, and this five point plan set out what should be our response. We added a six item in Africa, uh, which then covered also mobile money, but it covered everything from ensuring that our network works, to supporting businesses, including micro and small businesses, to help children to access education, including zero rating of education platforms, to expand support for critical services so that government can respond in the best possible way, as well as to develop full insights to governments as so as to be able to have the right response through the containment phase and then subsequently uh, devising the appropriate exit strategies. Just a few examples, perhaps, to bring it to life. Um, Around one fifth of the world's total internet traffic runs through Vodafone's networks uh, worldwide, which basically means that uh, we could see very quickly the significant increase in traffic. Now, luckily, we have been able to respond to that by um, in real time expanding the capacity of our networks to respond to that demand. So that's under the maintaining of the quality of service. Um, the second thing is. Uh, of course, we're having almost like pop up uh, hospitals and 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 ensuring in the case of uh, people desperately trying to get reach health authorities to make sure that everyone can constantly connect with their health um, services and get the support that they can. So obviously we have put a lot of emphasis in making sure that all government critical functions, people can access them in the best possible way. So. In that also, we have taken, as Stefan would refer to also, uh, many companies have responded, in my view, fantastically to try to address the, the, the real problem of vulnerable customers, both businesses and citizens. In the first couple of weeks of uh, this crisis, two and a half million employees, we transited from office environment to work from home environment. And many of them was for the first time. And that's a trend that has continued. And obviously, this is a fundamental shift in how many companies will organize themselves going forward. And that included 96% of Vodafone's around 100,000 staff, including a customer service in India, which I think is gonna be a rather interesting experience, uh, re having customer care uh, running out of kitchens in ordinary Indian homes as of now. Uh, but there's a very, very significant change that is happening in the way we organize uh, businesses and for all our business clients. And then finally, just to say on the big data platform, uh, of course, we have worked on malaria and other uh, communicable diseases in Africa. And because of that, we could uh, both use mobility insights um, for which we have built a big data platform to support governments. But we also then have a virus propagation simulations. Uh, uh, luckily, we were working on malaria, so we could really quickly repurpose the team to deal with the COVID-19. So we're supporting governments with also simulation models on how the virus is uh, spreading using real data around mobility in an anonymized and aggregated format. I think the learnings for us and, and looking now at the next step, 
so the recovery phase is going to be a very, very difficult one. We're, we're dealing with a deeper recession as, um, than um, we, we could have imagined plus what we are used to. Um, in broadly speaking, we're talking about a triple whamming for the economy, a supply side shock, a demand side shock and a financial shock. And then on top of that, the fact that many of us are going to have to learn how to coexist with the health risk for quite some time while there is a lack of uh, 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 vaccination. And for that reason, we really do need to see an urgent push, in our view, to identify what are the key things we need to drive uh, in short, medium and long term to ensure societal resilience at individual level, at business level and at government level. And in that, a clear acceleration of digital applications, um, uh, ensuring that they reach everyone. And by the way, I think it's important to highlight here that our learning from this crisis is that Europe has always focused a lot on affordability of digital solutions, which I think is it has been good. Uh, it has proven that it's a fundamentally different question whether people are literate and uh, the digital solutions are uh, uh, are accessible. So greater emphasis on accessibility and digital literacy is going to have to continue over this. From our point of view, uh, the three things we think uh, governments and uh, uh, industry together in partnership need to drive. First is that we need to rapidly ensure future proof resilient networks and that implies that we need to expand uh, the networks, including uh, fast deployment of 5G. Second is that we need to really emphasize the uh, societal uh, digital inclusion. So digital applications through government services like education and health is still too uh, dispersed on who can access it. UK is a fantastic example when they launched a government e-learning platform. 80% of the public school kids struggled to access it, either because of their home environment not being conducive to education or because they simply didn't have the tools to access the, the nice platform that existed. And third is the digitization of businesses. Um, clearly, the virus is showing the socioeconomic discriminatory effects depend on the size of business or the type of sector you're in, but more importantly, it depends on the degree by which you were digitized going into the crisis. So quickly ramping up uh, digitization, accelerating digital applications for companies so that they are more resilient and adaptable as we continue to live with, through with this virus. I think there are many other learnings specific um, to the individual items, but fundamentally from our point of view, we've seen uh, the importance of a European wide response. And we've very much seen the importance of also having clear cut guidance coming from the European Union especially related to European law, where we still struggle with the quite a lot of fragmentation that slows down the response. And for that reason, I echo many of the previous uh, speakers and colleagues who have referred to uh, a, a much more bold ambition for Europe going forward. And I think Europe can play a significant role in the recovery phase, putting, making sure that our economies and our societies are put on the right trajectory towards resilience, using digital as one of the main levers. Thank you. Very much, uh, Joachim. Uh, very clear um, indeed. Uh, thank you for sharing. Well, we um, are now uh, approaching uh, the time of the questions. But first, I would like to give the floor to uh, Giampiero Lottito, our first uh, respondent, for some comments after listening to these uh, interesting remarks from our speakers. Giampiero, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning to all. Um, landscape that they described is uh, very large and complete. Uh, what I can uh, resume and in some way add are a few short and uh, uh, quick points. Uh, uh, first of all, the potential to face the crisis uh, is done also from the reaction that we had, uh, for example, in Italy. I am uh, 500 meters far from the hospital where was uh, hospitalized the first patient, patient one in Italy, and our company is uh, since two months in uh, smart working without losing one hour of work. One hour of work was not lose. Uh, and we made four projects for this emergency, uh, uh, contributing uh, in uh, different ways uh, to face the crisis. Second, SMEs. Uh, don't forget that part of SMEs are uh, startups, uh, Erasmus scale ups, uh, that is the backbone of the digital industry of the future. So, 
uh, be care uh, every day to the life uh, of the startups and the scale ups in this crisis that is very difficult. Uh, third, uh, ecosystem builders. We will uh, look for the rising of organization, people, companies, networks that uh, we rise uh, a small ecosystem in Europe and non large ecosystem as was before, uh, because also the uh, lack of communication that we will have, for example, for traveling in the future, will favorite the rising of uh, uh, ecosystem builders and probably small valley concentrated uh, uh, um, um, cities, towns, uh, uh, environments of knowledge specialized uh, that is in the culture of Europe because innovation was done in the centuries in Europe in small centers with small university. And the last one, uh, innovative tenders. We need also to have tenders that will favorite the participation of a scale ups, digital company, and will quick the possibility to have a reaction. It was fantastic to participate to the tender for coronavirus one month ago, because for the first time, we as a scale up could participate uh, alone to the tender uh, with the ambition to have uh, uh, grant and equities. This is revolutionary. This is a great thing for the rising of a digital uh, industry in Europe. Thanks.